In early 2010, a team of geneticists in America began DNA testing on possibly the strangest looking skull ever discovered. Whilst trying to recover its nuclear DNA and matching it against the National Institute of Health database, they found a significant number of coherent base pairs that have never been seen before. This was an historic moment for science, as it proved beyond all reasonable doubt that part of the skull's DNA is not human. Since that result, the geneticists have predicted that when the final genome recovery is complete, it will provide science with the first record of alien DNA ever discovered. The skull's caretaker is Lloyd Pye. Lloyd, a researcher in aspects of human origins, named it the Star Child. It was found in Mexico in the 1930s, and through carbon dating, we know that the skull is over 900 years old. It has over two dozen major physiological differences to that of a human. These are the cuts in the skulls for DNA testing, and you see that the star child, when I've been saying it's half as thick, you see very clearly here. In some points, it's even less than half, and this is, you know, in the skull. So, I mean, there's just no exaggeration there. There's a complete difference in the bone throughout, uniformly, it's different. This is the biochemistry of a typical human bone. Its calcium and phosphorus levels are high, and its oxygen and carbon levels are low. But with the star child, it's quite different. The phosphorus is down, and the carbon and oxygen are up, indicating its biochemistry is more like tooth enamel than regular bone. This is uh, a uh, scanning electron microscope view of the bone, and this is the way bone is created. You have the cortical layer here, cortical layer here, and in here are the cancellous holes where the bone marrow moves. And coming out of um, some of the cancellous holes, but also embedded in the matrix of the bone are these, these fibers, these very durable, strange fibers that nobody's ever seen before, they're in no other species, and we don't really know what they are, but we just know that they're really durable because the Dremel blade that cut this through here did not cut cleanly these, these different fibers. That tells you they have a high, high resistance factor to the blade. It lacks frontal sinuses, has smaller chewing muscles, and is missing an inion. Instead, its neck connects on top of its frame and magnum opening, indicating that its neck is about half the size of a normal human neck. And here we see one clearly embedded in the matrix of the bone on the surface. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. And you know what science says about this? Ah, you probably dropped it on a carpet and it picked up carpet fibers. You know, just, I mean, really, that is the answer that I get. It has to be just fibers off a carpet or something. This can't be, it really can't be in the world of, of mainstream science, but there it is. This is a piece of upper right maxilla that was found with the star child. When one of the teeth was extracted, it was found to have very heavy roots, indicating it was an adult when it died. When the maxilla was x-rayed, a staggering five more teeth were discovered, waiting to come down. The key is that normal human bone, when you die, there are bacteria in your body that scour and eat every bit of your marrow out and they leave your bone polished, shining, just like this, just like you see. You could eat out of that just like the bacteria did. It's so clean. There is no marrow left anywhere. And this is the way it is with all animals when they die. With a star child, we see a big difference. And we also see a difference in the color too. It's much more milkier than that alabaster look of the human bone because it's got so much more collagen. But you see this red residue here sprinkled everywhere. We don't know what that is. Never seen it before, and it's not in any other species. It's not blood because when blood oxidizes, it's not our blood anyway, or our type blood, because when blood oxidizes, it turns black. So if that was bone marrow, that would, that would be black. So those two things, the, the fibers and the, um, and the um, residue, are just unknown in anything else. And here they sit in the star child, both of them, and yet science just says, you know, and this is what they say. This is what you need to understand about science and all of these physiological differences that I've just pointed out. They mean nothing to mainstream science. They mean nothing. In January of this year, a geneticist contacted me out of the blue, and he said, I think you really might have something. And he said, if you send me a sample, 
I will take a new technique, a new shotgunning technique, which recovers much smaller pieces than the old uh, primer technique. So he took it. About six weeks later, he got back in touch with me and he says, you're really not going to believe what, what's happening here. Uh, we, we don't, I don't believe it. I've done it enough times now to where I'm convinced that I'm doing it right and we're getting some very unusual results. Some of it comes out human, sure enough. You see right here, this sequence of 265 base pairs long, 265, no question about it, part of the star child is human. Except, next slide, some of the star child's DNA comes back with this incredible reading. No significant similarity found. 342 base pairs long. It's a coherent base pair sequence not found in the NIH database. I said, well, what's the answer? And he says, well, it could be, and here's where we go off the deep end, it could be that it's an alien, entirely an alien, born to a human mother. And I said, what? How would that happen? How would you get a pure alien born to a human mother? So he made up a slide for me and sent it to me. And he said, now understand, this is happening today. This is happening today. If a human female has mitochondrial disease, which means that her mitochondria are bad and are going to produce very, very flawed and dead children for the most part, if it's found out that she has that and she wants to have a, a child with her mate, her husband, what they can do is they can take her package, put it in a dish, you've heard about this, and mix it with her husband's sperm and create a zygote with her chromosome package and her husband's chromosome package. Then they take an egg, a good egg, from a third party, a third a woman, take that woman's chromosomal package out, put the zygote in, put that egg in the first woman, and she will have a baby that will be her and her husband's genes, but it will have the mitochondria of the third woman. So he said we could have the same thing. You'd have two aliens getting together, making a zygote, and for whatever reason, taking the, uh, the chromosomal package out of a female egg, putting it in, and then she will bring it to term, and it's a full alien, nothing but alien DNA in it, but it has her mitochondrial, human mitochondrial DNA. Now, why? Why would they do that? We don't have any idea. We know this is a radical thing to say. We know that it's going to be met with a lot of resistance because it's going to prove that we don't just have a, a, a hybrid between a human and an alien 900 years ago. We have genetic, clear genetic engineering, clear evidence of genetic engineering 900 years ago. It's a much bigger pill for science to swallow, and it's also going to cause a much bigger revolution in thinking among everybody because we're, it's going to be very hard to wrap minds around this. But this is where we are. This is what we think we can do. This is what we know we can do. We're now in the process of trying to get the money to start the process of sequencing the whole genome because when you sequence the genome, at the end of that period, it's only about three to four months. From the time you start, three to four months, you have an answer. And you have a general idea of what that percentage is going to be, whether it's 15 percent, 20 percent, whatever. You can do it within, say, five points of error, just recovering the whole genome. And then you have the period of eight to 12 months where they're going to have to fine tune it and figure out all of the unknown parts. And then they'll be able to say within a margin of error of one or two percentage what the difference is. And that difference is going to stick because anybody that does it again, that's the beauty of DNA. It's, it's the math of biology. It's repeatable again and again. And this is why we win because we are producing something they can't argue with. There isn't any of this business about nature can do anything. When it comes to DNA, DNA trumps nature. So whatever the DNA says is whatever is going to have to be accepted. And this is what we think it's going to say.